research at the Luxembourg Institute of Socioeconomic Research and University of Luxembourg. And today I would like to present uh, my paper on understanding inequality and poverty trends in Russia. And this is a joint work together with my supervisor, Philip Van Kerm. Um, so right after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was an increase in research on income inequality in Russia. And this has a lot to do with the data availability. Early studies focused on the transition from land to market economy and its effects on income distribution. Later studies focused on the impact of economic growth that took place from the 2000s on, once again, income inequality. Those two groups of studies found that um, income inequality increased right after the fall of the Soviet Union uh, and this pattern refers in 2000. They found that top and bottom tails of income distribution were gaining the shares while the median class was losing. Um, they also found that um, the economic growth had a pro-poor nature, meaning that um, the lowest or the poorest were experiencing much higher income growth than the richest. And uh, they also found that um, Russian society was very mobile. This means that people were changing positions in income distribution very easily. Um, more recent studies focus on documenting top income shares, on understanding mobility trends, and explaining wage inequality. Though understanding the wage inequality is important, we still lack understanding of determinants of trends in income inequality and poverty in Russia. And this is exactly what we do in our paper. So, so what are these trends? Um, here you see trends of income inequality and poverty. Um, income is measured with different indicators. So you see Gini, different percentile ratios. You also see the poverty rate uh, that is defined as 50% of the median income. And you also see the median income itself and the average income. So first of all, what you see is that the dynamics, the evolution is quite similar. So first, the income inequality and poverty increased, reaching its peak in 1998, and then it decreased. We also see that uh, different parts of income distribution lost the shares in different years. So the tens, the lowest tens decile lost the shares in 1996, while the richest lost the shares in 1998, so two years later. We also see that um, the average income is above the median income. This means that majority of Russians possess less than the average income. And the, um, we also document increasing income levels. And what we do in our study, we try to explain these trends. So, and we do this using this data. That is a Russian longitudinal monitoring survey that is conducted every year since 1994, and it is uh, conducted by the University of North Carolina in the US, and this university, the Higher School of Economics. It is a panel and cross-sectional data um, that surveys uh, individuals and households. The unit of our analysis are individuals, those individuals that live in households. The variable of our interest is total household disposable income adjusted by the OECD modified scale, the regional price differences, and uh, the inflation. Um, we decided to use this data source because it provides a rich information on income sources together with different household and individual characteristics, which is very important for our study because we would like to understand what is behind the trends in income inequality and poverty. Um, I guess the most common critique of any research on income inequality in Russia is the fact that we are not capturing those at the top income shares. Um, so we claim that we use uh, those inequality measures that are not too sensitive to the changes in top income shares. We also compare our inequality estimates to those from the Novak Med and his colleagues studied, and we find similar trends but different levels. And uh, we would like to include those people into our study, but it is very technically and empirically difficult, and that's why we still claim an importance to analyze the income dynamics of 99% of the population in Russia. So, we take this data, we analyze different household and individual characteristics, and we focus only on those that changed since 1994. 
and we divide them into three groups, and we call them so-called possible determinants. The first group are changes in social demographic characteristics, uh, which we include their family type, family size, number of children, pensioners, and individual with tertiary education. The second group are um, so-called labor market participation. We include here share of employed and full-time employed individuals. And the last group are changes in market returns. And um, here we included five different income sources, um, earnings from private and public sector, pensions, um, other income sources, which might include, for example, capital income, um, rental income, and also other benefits, for example, employment benefits, child benefits. So once again, those are the, ch the things that changed the most since 1994. We documented the changes in income inequality, and now what we want to know is how changes in these determinants can relate to changes in income inequality and poverty in Russia. And in order to answer this question, we apply semi-parametric re-weighting methods introduced by Dinar Le Fort in Lemur in 1996 econometric paper. And uh, the idea of this method is to build a counterfactual state of the world where we keep some determinants fixed in time but change everything else. Then we estimate inequality and poverty once again and we compare those two a counterfactual state and the actual state, and that's how we define the impact of the determinant. So let's say we would like to estimate changes in income distribution between two years, and we would like to relate those changes to changes in social demographic characteristics. And therefore, we build, so this is the first equation, we build a counterfactual state of the world where we keep those determinants fixed at the base year, but change everything else. Um, at the second stage of our analysis, we would like to relate changes in income distribution to changes in labor market participation, and therefore build once again a counterfactual state of the world where we fix those social demographic characteristics and labor market participation conditional on those social demographic characteristics as at the base year. At the third stage of our analysis, uh, we do um, we build a little bit different counterfactual distribution, and that is a distribution which accounts for expected change in market returns due to those two first groups of predeterminants. And we do this for each and every income source, that is for private sector, public sector earnings, pensions, other income sources, and other benefits. Um, at the last stage of our analysis, we check how changes in levels and in dispersion uh, can explain changes in income inequality. And we do this because income levels change a lot in time. So that's why when we fix income level, we combine two effects. So these are the effects of changes in income levels and effect of changes in dispersion. And we would like to separate those two effects. And we do this by fixing the income source and then by allowing to grow it as fast as the average um, growth rate of the total household income, that is the first equation of the stage four, and then we once again fix the income source, and then we allow it to grow as fast as the average, um, as the growth rate of the average income source. So that is uh, the very last equation. So, the results. Um, these are the actual results, and um, Whenever you see my results, you always should try to answer the question. And the question is, uh, what would happen to income inequality and poverty in Russia if particular determinant would not change since the base year? And the base year for the results I'm going to show you is 2000. We also arrived this year and our results do not change. So, so these are the results. The blue line or probably you see it as a black line, denotes the actual state of the world, so the actual income distribution in Russia. The orange line uh, denotes the counterfactual distribution, and the arrows, if you are able to see them, uh, they denote the impact, the direction of the impact. So I will help you. 
Um, so we see that the changes in social demographic characteristics do not explain the changes in income inequality because these two lines are almost similar, but they do explain the changes in the average income. And we see that the, um, if these determinants would stay as in 2000, then the income levels would be higher. Or put it differently, the evolution of those characteristics was so that it decreased the average income. These are the changes in labor market participation, and uh, actually we see a similar result. Um, those, this determinant does not explain changes in income inequality and poverty, but it somehow decreased the average income. I also show you the gross incidence curve. Um, this curve, first of all, shows you the gross at each and every income percentile between 2015 and 2000 years. And the first and the, the, the horizontal line is the gross of the average income. So first of all, what we see is that the lowest tail of income distribution experience much higher income growth than those at the, um, at the top, which is very natural. And we also see, once again, that the evolution of those two um, determinants decreased the income growth at the whole income distribution for each and every income percentile. Um, now I will switch to changes in uh, market returns. So once again, these are the actual results. And this is what would happen if public sector earnings would be fixed in 2000. So what we see is that the evolution of these earnings had resulted in decrease in income inequality, poverty, some percentile ratios, and increase in income levels, and especially at the lower part of income distribution. Or put it differently, if those earnings would be fixed in 2000, then the inequality and poverty would be much higher. Uh, these are the changes for private sector earnings. Um, we find quite similar the results. So if those earnings would not change since 2000, then the inequality and poverty would be much higher and income levels, and especially those at the lower part of income distribution would be much lower. We also find that uh, private sector earnings had the largest equalizing effect or had the largest effect on the income levels. So this is what we see when looking at the average graph. Uh, these are the changes in pensions. And the results are once again the same. If pensions would not change since the South, and then inequality and poverty would be much higher. And uh, we find that changes in pensions had the largest equalizing effect on income inequality and poverty. Um, I do not show you the results for other two income sources. And the reason is simple. They do not explain changes in income inequality and poverty. Uh, these are the gross incidence curves, uh, which show you the gross for each and every income percentiles um, if particular income sources would be fixed. And uh, once again, we see that if earnings from private sector and public sector and pensions would be fixed in time, then income growth would be much lower, and especially for the lower part of income distribution. And once again, we see that the pensions brought the strongest increase in income levels for the lower part of income distribution. Uh, now I come to the last section of uh, my presentation. And this is um, about changes in levels and in dispersion. So uh, when we analyzed uh, the impact of earnings, what we did is we simply fixed the income levels in time. So for the result that I show you, we fix them in a 2000 level. And what we do here is that we fix them, but then we allow to increase it by the average growth of the total household income between two periods. And uh, for the second part of the graph, that is the bottom, we increase it by the average growth of the public sector earnings. So once again, the blue line, or probably you see it like a black line, is the actual state of the world. The orange line is when we fix the income levels, and the dashed orange line is when we allow it to grow as fast as the uh, total household income or the earnings from public sector. And what we see is that the orange dashed line comes back to the actual state of the world. This means that, on average, public sector earnings increase at the same rate for everyone. This means that 
It is about levels. It is not about dispersion because uh, the earnings increased for everyone at the same level. This means that the increase in levels had resulted in decrease in income inequality and poverty in Russia. Similar results we find for pensions. We see that the orange dashed line come back, comes back to the actual line. This means that it's about uh, this, uh, this means that it's about increase in levels, which resulted in decrease in income inequality and poverty. And uh, these are the results for the private sector earnings. And we see that the orange dashed line does not come back to the uh, blue line, which means that the uh, private sector earnings did not increase for everyone at the same rate, which means it is about decrease in dispersion in private sector earnings, which resulted in decrease in income inequality and poverty. Um, so the conclusions, uh, in this paper we study determinants of changes in income inequality and poverty in Russia. Uh, we documented decrease in income inequality and increase in income levels. And we would like to know why did this happen. Uh, we analyze different household and individual characteristics and we find that Changes in social demographic characteristics and labor market participation do not explain changes in income inequality, but they somehow um, resulted in decrease in income levels. And uh, we find that the evolution of market returns had resulted in decrease in income inequality and poverty. Pensions had the largest equalizing effect on inequality and poverty, and the private sector earnings had the strongest positive effect on income levels. And falling inequality and poverty is a result of decreasing dispersion of private sector earnings and increasing levels of pensions and public sector earnings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, they, they change it some far. They change it some far. Yeah. 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 So thanks a lot for this very nice and uh, interesting paper, which is uh, discussing Brinsman in a difficult position, uh, because the paper is already very nice and very sober. So this is what, what to discuss them on this paper. And uh, um, therefore, I, my, my general conclusion in reading the paper, uh, it's already generally well, well crafted, well done, and uh, therefore my comments are mostly for, for further polishing the paper uh, rather than doing something separate. At the very end, I make a suggestion how to develop that kind of analysis uh, a, bit, a bit further. Um, well, uh, this is now for, for those who have read the paper. The focus is on these three uh, groups of uh, social demographic factors, labor market participation, uh, labor market returns. Um, well, for example, on, on page 14, which is now not uh, written here, you give a kind of hypothesis which doesn't sound for me uh, too conclusive. Mm -hmm. So, because you say, well, it's going up, it's going down, but I, I think that some of well, these kind of explanations should be rethought a bit, and I can give you more uh, mm -hmm. detailed comments on, on this particular. Uh, parts of the, of the paper. Um, also, for example, on the labor market participation, the wording is the increase would have a large and positive effect on inequality poverty. Well, positive means inequality poverty should be reduced, I think. Yes, yeah. uh, so it, it is yeah. kind of wording which is struck when reading the paper, so to say it's, it's a bit of a kind of easy, but it can be of uh, polished. In, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, also, in your labor market, there's complexity makes it difficult to predict, but then you'll say, well, uh, should lead to a decrease of poverty. So I think this kind of uh, hypothesis needs to be more back, but could be the different angles and then mm -hmm. what to select out in the end mm -hmm. as a kind of explanatory uh, factors. Um, on the methodology, um, well, the data you already had in, in, the, in the presentation, but uh, maybe I overlooked in the paper on these high income households, but you already tackled that in the, in the presentation. Uh, I personally cannot judge because you opted for one data set, so it would be another alternative, but uh, I am not uh, in the position to, to judge your, your, uh, your decision in a sense, uh, but I'm sure you did a good job. Um, in the 
methodological part, you introduced uh, this, this method, the FL method, uh, which you say is easy to implement, but you have seen in the formulas it's not that easy to understand for uh, non-experts. Mm -hmm. um, and you highlight some limitations which you have not addressed in the presentation, that it might be sensitive to the order of determinants and how you integrate them. Uh, and it does not account for interactions between groups of determinants. I will come back to that point later because it would be my suggestion for, for further uh, development. Uh, when reading through the uh, method section, I thought a bit more guidance for the non-expert reader would be, would be highly appreciated. Okay. Uh, particularly, for example, in the first step you estimate a kind of logic or a profit mm -hmm. uh, equation. Uh, which is not specified and results are not given. So mm -hmm. and we just well, I regress x mm -hmm. on t. Mm -hmm. So for example, I don't know whether you regress the x on each single year, Oops. or if you regress it on just a time span, what's the significance of the parameters, and so on and so forth. Something like, oh, when reading the paper, it's, it's missing information mm -hmm. for if you really go into the details. Mm -hmm. um, and how they is exactly specified on a yearly basis so as a panel and mm -hmm. so on and so forth, that would be nice to have. Um, for example, we could also give examples for a specific household, how the things change and how this looks like after the, after the separation of the mm -hmm. equation, which mm -hmm. makes it more readable for the, for the, for the readers. Um, so the results you have seen in the presentation is uh, quite nicely and, and intuitively documented. Uh, very interesting. Um, in some cases, I saw some more in-depth explanation what behind these developments would be highly appreciated. Um, for example, you, one result is the mean income is increasing if labor market participation changes, which means it's increasing. So the natural question is what is behind that? Why is an increase in the participation decrease the mean income? That might be because particular groups have increased the participation and so on and so forth, so that uh, something like a more uh, kind of flesh on the bones would be, would be appreciated. Um, and, or for example, why was the dispersion of the private sector earnings becoming lower? Um, again, oh, I'm not a Russian expert, so expert on Russian economy, but there, there must be some factors behind that, and that would be nice on top of these results to be, to be uh, documented or discussed. Uh, then uh, I wondered whether you plot the mean income uh, whether a change in the median income might also be interesting, and whether this makes some, some big differences, maybe not, but it would be good to, to, to note to, to show. The general result is well taken, so a decrease in income inequality and poverty in Russia, which is quite substantial. So you have seen the Gini points decrease by some 10 percentage points, uh, Gini points, uh, is a result of the increase in levels and pensions and earnings from public sector, and decrease in the dispersion of private sector's earnings. Okay, again, the factors behind would be interesting to, to have a, board, a bit more knowledge. Final point uh, on these limitations of this DFL approach and a suggestion which you might take into account, or I'm even not sure whether it's technically possible, but it might be interesting. Uh, you mentioned that there are some kind of sensitivity to the order of determinants, how you include them in your analysis. Of course, that could be easily remedied by robustness check with a different order. So that would be the easiest step. Uh, second point you mentioned is it does not account for interactions between groups of determinants. Uh, and I think both items could be kind of tackled by using this what is called the Shapley value decomposition approach. Uh, Shapley, you know, in the paper 1953, had a paper, a game theoretic paper, and basically arguing that if you uh, consider all potential combinations of, uh, uh, of factors, for example, then you can get the kind of result which sorts out everything in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the set. Um, this was taken up by uh, Shorox in a paper in 2013. Still not sure whether this paper is published or not, but it's a, it's a, it's a PDF version on the, in you find it on the internet. But mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very well done paper, but I think it's not published. Uh, and basically, he, he just says to, to calculate the Shapley value of the factor, as the, which is a basically a weighted mean of all its marginal contributions to all possible combinations of contributions. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, he argues this, sorts out everything, and you can really disentangle this effect. Mm -hmm. This is uh, computationally very intensive, 
because for three sectors we have six combinations, for four factors you have 24, for five factors you have 120 and so on. But you can group these factors in a sense and you could do some, some kind of these marginal uh, contributions. Um, then you can calculate the weighted averages and calculate the average and you have get rid of this kind of limitations mm -hmm. of the DFL. Yeah. So that might be an interesting mm -hmm. point also from a kind of technical uh, development of, of this approach. These are my comments, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I guess there is a lot to, to discuss and to answer. Um, yes, I agree about, so of course I know about all of these limitations of the DFL approach. Uh, yeah, the order of determinants might matter. So I guess um, we're talking about the order of determinants within each and every group. So if I talk about, for example, labor market participation, I don't have to put labor market participation at the end. So I guess it's quite logical that we kind of first start from the predeterminants, let's say kind of age, and then we'll go to the labor market participation, and then to the income. But yeah, I think it might also matter to double check the order within each and every group. So of course, yeah, we'll have to do this. Um, there, yeah, the significance of the results, uh, this is now my to-do list. Um, I had kind of troubles, so we want to do it with the bootstrap and I couldn't somehow replicate okay. the, the survey design. So if, if anyone had experience with this, um, please come back to me. <laughs> um, yes, so what else I should say? Well, in general, I agree with all of your comments. Uh, thank you very much for this um, additional decomposition method approach. Um, why dispersion of earnings um, in private sector decreased? So I guess we have to go maybe into deeper into the industries. And there is another paper that is doing for Russia, that is doing this for Russia. So that's why we don't go further. And you also asked why changes in, in uh, labor market participation and social demographic characteristics uh, affected uh, median income or affected average income in a negative way. And we assume it's a scaling effect because uh, we um, document or we observe that families are getting smaller. So I guess just the total household income is, you know, is just getting smaller because there are less uh, family members and more pensioners. So it's a scaling effect. Um, I think that's it from my side. Yes, okay, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Um, um, yes, um, I'm not sure if I discussed this in my paper, but the thing is that if we include this, then um, I guess it's the same discussion as with taxes. We don't include taxes. And the reason is that there are such a big share of people that are unofficially employed. So this means that the minimum wage doesn't apply for them. That's why, why I don't believe that this instrument might affect anyhow the income inequality just because there are so many people that are unofficially employed. Yeah, of course, we use what we have, and what we have is 1994, 2015. Um, I guess it's not about that it would change our results.